Hello. Um, the stuff we're going to talk about in this video might seem like a bit of, of a departure from what we've been doing. And, and once we get into the next section, it might even seem a little bit like it's disconnected from that as well. But this is really the bridge that ties uh, indefinite integrals with definite integrals. So it's an important section, but at the same time, it's, it's a bit of a departure from directly from what we've been talking about. So just kind of bear with it, maybe, <laughs> and enjoy the ride. Um, we're going to talk today about something called summation notation, which uses a, a, a symbol you're maybe not familiar with. It's a, it's a Greek letter uh, called sigma. And it's used for when you have to add up a long list of numbers in a, a, an arithmetic sequence. That is, a sequence where each term is a fixed amount more than the previous term. Like, a real basic one would be this. Well, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 blah 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 blah, blah plus 20. With a sigma, with a sum, sum notation, a very quick way of writing this exact same information would be with a summation sign or a sigma. Now the Greeks would look at this and be like, yeah, it's a letter of our alphabet. What do you do and turn it into a, <laughs> some math meaning? I don't know why we pick on the Greek alphabet so much in math, but we do. Delta, pi, theta, and now sigma. Now what we would do is we would say, our first term in here is 1, our second term is 2, and so on. It's a pretty easy pattern to figure out. I'm going to call this the summation of i. They use, typically use i as the letter here. I, you can use whatever, though. Um, starting with an, uh, an i value of 1 and stopping here with an i value of 20. So this literally means plug in 1 for i, and then just follow the pattern of integers. Plug in 2 for i, plug in 3 for i, plug in 4 for i, and stop when you get to 20, and then the summation sign means add them all up. So the Greek letter sigma means the sum of in math. The number at the bottom where they, they define the variable typically, and then also the first value of that variable at the bottom. They call that the lower bound. So that'll be the first number that gets subbed in for the variable in the function. So the first number we're going to sub in for i is 1. And that makes this top number the upper bound. That would be the last number that gets subbed in for the variable in the function. So you know when to stop the sequence, basically. It just so happens if you added all this up, uh, kind of the quick way of doing this, <laughs> this is 1 and this is 20. If you add them up, that's 21. This is 2, and this is 19. If you add that up, it's 21. This is 3, this is 18. If you add that up, it's 21. And that 21, 21 would work inward until you get to 10 plus 11, which is also 21. So there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 pairs of 21s. So 10 times 21, obviously, would be 210. Another way of writing this same sequence, here we have the same sequence, which is still going to add up to 210. If I didn't want to start with i equaling 1, maybe I instead wanted to start with i equaling 2. So that makes this the 2 term, the 3 term, the 4, 5, 6. That would make this the 21st term then. So instead of stopping at plugging, since we're starting plugging in 2 instead of 1, we're going to stop by plugging in 21 instead of 20. And all we'd have to do then, if we were going to write an expression or a function in here, would be to take i. Well, if I plug 2 in now, I don't get 1 anymore. I, I get 2. So I have to take 1 away, and the result would be the same. You can test it. You plug in the first thing. Plug in 2. 2 minus 1 is 1. Plug in 21. 21 minus 1 is 20, and that is the last term. So there are more than one way. In fact, there are infinite ways to write this sequence using uh, some notation. Uh, let's take a look at this example. Uh, the pattern here, the slope of this, if you will, the common difference, I guess they call it, the common difference from term to term is, uh, is plus 3. So 3 plus 3 is 6, plus 3 is 9, and they, they didn't bother typing all the middle things. 
Uh, but it, it, that pattern continues throughout. You get 600, 603, 606. Those are all just adding three each time. So you're basically taking the placement of the term. This is term one is three, term two is six, term three is nine. You're basically taking the term number, which is i, and multiplying it by three. So to get the first term, i would have to be one. To get the second term, three times two would be six, three times third term would be nine, three times fourth term would be 12, and then the 606th term. Well, to figure out where to stop, you're, you're really taking that 606 and dividing it by three, and that'll tell you how many numbers you have to plug in. In reality, you get 202. If you plug in 202 for i and multiply it by three, that's your 606, that means you're done. If you were to work this, uh, this sum out, it would come out to 61,509. Right, we'll talk about, uh, in the next video, we'll talk about quick shortcut ways of determining those values without actually having to sit there with a, a, a calculator or, heaven forbid, a, a pen and paper. All right, in general, a sum of a sub i. So a sub i is your function. Going from a lower bound of, say, 1 until an upper bound of whatever is just going to give you a sub whatever you get when you plug in 1 plus a sub whatever you get when you plug in 2 plus a sub whatever you get when you plug in 3 and so on until you get to a sub n, until you're plugging in this stop number, this top or upper limit. That's your a sub n. A sub i is called the ith term. If you want to know the fifth term, that's a sub 5. And the resulting terms are just that. They're the terms of the sequence. Some examples. Let's find the summation from 3 to 5 of 1 over i. So we're going to have to plug in 3, we're going to have to plug in 4, we're going to have to plug in 5, we're going to get three separate, in this case, fractions, and then we're going to have to add them up because of the summation sign. Then we'll be done with this problem. So we really have a third when you plug in three, a fourth when you plug in four, and a fifth when you plug in five. Of course, to add fractions, you need a common denominator. Uh, three and four and five, I think, all go into 60. Three goes into 60 20 times. So a third is like 20 sixtieths. Four goes into 60 15 times. So a fourth is like 15 sixtieths. And five goes into 60 12 times. So one fifth is like 12 sixtieths. If you add this all up, you get 47 sixtieths. Another one we can kind of plug and chug our way through. We're going to start by plugging in 2 into this function. They're using j here instead of i. Oh, whoops, this is supposed to be a j equals 2. All right, plug in 2, you get 4 minus 10. That's negative 6. Plug in 3, you get 9 minus 10. That's negative 1. Plug in 4, you get 16 minus 10, that's 6. Plug in 5, you get 25 minus 10, that's 15. Plug in 6, and then we'll be done. Plug in 6, you get 36 minus 10, that's 26. The negative 6 and the positive 6, we can negate those. Here we have uh, 41, and then minus 1 would be 40. And now kind of looking at things a little bit backwards here, they're giving you the sum, and they want you to write uh, the expression using a summation sign. This is a little, a lot of little things going on here. 
If you look across the top, you're obviously, well, we're going to have a fraction as part of our function. I think that's safe to say. These are all, all these terms are fractions themselves. So our function inside our summation is probably going to be a fraction as well. The numerators of the fractions we can look at independently of the denominators. The numerators, one, two, three, that, you know, it's a pretty basic pattern. If we're going to start out with i equaling one, then we can just say the numerators are always i. And by definition, they will increase by one each time, which will give us our one, our two, our three, and so on. And then we'll have to stop, obviously, when we get to seven. Now the denominators all have an x in them. X is independent of i here. X is just that kind of that lunky thing that shows up in every single denominator. So I'm going to go ahead and slap it into the denominator of the function. Since it's there in every term, it might, we might as well go ahead and put it in the function. Now what does change in the denominator is the coefficient. We go from 2 to 3 to 4. So we're, really, we're still increasing by 1, which will be a nice consistent thing to work with with the summation. But it gets, uh, it gets a head start. This 2 is, is 1 ahead of the numerator. And this 3 is 1 ahead of its numerator. And this 4 is 1 ahead of its numerator. So in general, in our function inside the summation, we need to make our coefficient here 1 more than the numerator. Well, if the numerator is i, and we want to be 1 ahead of it, let's just call this i plus 1 in a set of parentheses. You know, you can distribute that x through if you want, but there's really nothing wrong with writing it just the way you are, just the way it is. All right, a couple of properties of this summation stuff. Oh, you're going to recognize these, I do believe. If you've been paying any attention this year, you'll, you'll recognize these. We've seen them with, um, with limits, we've seen them with derivatives, and we've seen them now uh, with integrals or an antiderivatives. Well, the same phenomena occur with summations. If you are summing a constant times a function from 1 until whatever, guess what you can do with that constant? If you said or thought, pull it out and write it as a constant out front, you're absolutely right. We're going to pull that constant out and then just sum the simpler function. Let's have the same limits of uh, summation. Also, if you have a sum or difference of functions that you are summing, so a sub i plus or minus b sub i, you can write each of these uh, individual functions with its own summation sign. So you can say, well, that's the same as going from 1 to n of a sub i, and then either plus or minus summing 1 to n of b sub i. Again, the same properties that apply to limits, derivatives, and antiderivatives also apply to summation. So a couple, or actually just one example here. Well, with two parts. Let's apply those properties to this sum and see if it's the same thing we get as if we just don't apply the properties and calculate the expression directly. So I guess we'll start with that, start with the direct method. If I plug 0 in for k, my first term would be 2. Then I'm going to plug in 1 and get 3 plus 2 is 5. I'm going to plug in 2, get 3 times 2 is 6, plus 2 is 8. I'm going to plug in 3, get 3 times 3 is 9, plus 2 is 11. I'm going to plug in 4, and then I'll be done. 3 times 4 is 12, 2 more is 14. If you add up these five numbers, you get 40. So we should also get 40 if we break this apart into two separate sums, and then also pull the 3 out of just that first sum, because the 3 is only affecting the first term in the function.
So we should be able to do the sum of uh, 0 to 4. Uh, I'll put the 3. It's a K. Yeah, that's a K. So that's pulling the 3 out of just the first term. If you pull the 2 in the second term, there's nothing left over inside the sum. So I'm just going to leave the 2 there. Let's see what we get. So for the first summation, I'm going to put 3, and then instead of parentheses, I'll put all these 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. And in the second sum, uh, when I plug in 0, uh, the result is still going to be 2. When I plug in 1, the result is still going to be 2, because there's no variable to tell me otherwise. It's kind of like if you're graphing y equals 4. Well, what if x is 10? Well, y is still 4. What if x is 0? y is still 4. So it doesn't really matter what the k value is here, because the result is going to be 2 every single time. So we're going to get uh, 2 when we plug in 0, 2 when we plug in 1, 2 when we plug in 2, 2 when we plug in 3, and 2 when we plug in 4. If you add this all up, this is 1, 3, 6, 10 times 3 is 30. This is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. As a result, you get 40. So we have at least verified the property. And we'll talk about, um, I mean, a lot of you can probably see, hmm, this is a little suspicious. Can we just take 2 uh, the number of times the number of terms? And yeah, we can. That's, there's five terms here. 0 through 4 is actually five terms. So that's why we had five twos. And, and in the next video, we'll talk about some shortcuts for dealing with these predictable patterns.